Hello, everyone. I'm Chris Goodwin with the Mississippi Department of Archives and History. Welcome to this week's History is Lunch program, which is sponsored by the John and Lucy Shackelford Charitable Fund of the Community Foundation for Mississippi. We're in our home, the Craig H. Nielsen Auditorium in the Museum of Mississippi History and Mississippi Civil Rights Museum, and we're streaming live on both Facebook and YouTube. And since I'm often asked about it, all those videos are available to watch anytime on both of those platforms. You can see them on any device that connects to the internet. For instance, a smartphone. And if you have not already silenced yours, please do so now. At noon tomorrow, Thursday, February 23rd, at Theodore Welty House and Garden, Paige Mazel of Mazel Camellia Nursery will discuss varieties grown by Welty and have old-fashioned specialty camellias for sale. And then on Saturday, February 25th, We'll have a beginning African-American genealogy workshop at 10 a.m. next door in the Winter Building. The program is free, but space is limited, so contact can be AH to register. The Natchez Literary and Cinema Celebration is this week on February 23rd and 24th with lots of great free panels and programs. And on March 2nd and 3rd, the Mississippi Historical Society will hold its annual meeting in these museums. Brochures for both of those events are by the coffee and snacks. Finally, I hope you'll come back next Wednesday for History is Lunch when Martin Zwiz will speak, uh, who spoke several years ago when his biography of Senator James Eastland was published, will discuss his new project, Raceland, the Ecology of Segregation. Today, I am delighted to welcome Danielle Dreilinger to discuss her new book, The Secret History of Home Economics, How Trailblazing Women Harnessed the Power of Home and Changed the Way We Live. Danielle Dreilinger is an American South storytelling reporter for Gannett USA Today Network. Before moving to Durham, North Carolina in 2021, she was a 2018 Knight Wallace Journalism Fellow at the University of Michigan and worked for the Times-Picayune, WGBH News, and the Boston Globe. Dreilinger's work has appeared in publications ranging from the Atlantic to Plowshares to No Depression. She earned her BA in English from Columbia University. The Secret History of Home Economics is her first book, Help me welcome Danielle Dreilinger. Well, thank you all so much. It is great to be here. So we're gonna, I'm gonna talk for about 45 minutes or so, and then we're going to have an opportunity for you guys to ask questions. I hope you have many questions. So the I'm getting the, of course, the very moment you need to remember which button to use, you use the wrong button. Pardon me a sec. So I am talking today about home economics with a bit of a focus on Mississippi because there's some Mississippi people who played a really important role. Uh, so here is me, you just, just heard the bio, most importantly, here are my cats. Uh, that is Alexander the action cat on the top. He's being very helpful. That is Malcolm on the bottom. He is being even more helpful. Uh, and the other thing to know about me is that I actually am the daughter of a home economist. My mother worked for General Foods when I was a child, and she worked on Jello and Kool-Aid and things like that. And I forgot all about this until I was, you know, good six months into this project. I just completely forgot. So, quick question is, what do you think when you think about home economics? And I really, like, please, call, call some things out. Uh, Housekeeping. Housekeeping. Sewing. 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 Yep. Baking. 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 Learning to cook. Uh, and I heard some women talking earlier about how you, know, they, you, you would even take if you were in, like, a college prep track, right? for people who weren't going to college. Um, so yeah, I think this, you know, this is what people think of when they think of home economics, right? They think of a 50s housewife. You know, they think of Donna Reed, June Cleaver, you know, this white woman in her perfect apron that is not even meant to be used, devoting her life to keeping her house and keeping her family happy with a smile on her face. And, or, you know, maybe the dark side version, right? Like the Mad Men feminine mystique version where you have the same woman, but she's an alcoholic and you know, miserable. But either way, it's you know, a woman who is a homemaker. 
So this is what home economics really was. This here is Dr. Flemmie Kittrell. She was a dean of home economics at several HBCUs. She was the first black woman to earn a doctorate in nutrition, first black woman to earn a doctorate at Cornell. She was a, an educator. She's from North Carolina originally. She traveled all over the world starting schools of home economics internationally. She was the first person to do a nutritional survey of an entire country, which was Liberia, analyzing what people ate and the nutritional breakdown of it. And actually this, she, clearly she was involved in business in some way because this shot appears to be a promotional shot, right, for these two margarine companies, right? There's, they, those boxes wouldn't be there by accident. So that's the thing, is that home economics was, from the start, a field created for and by career women. It was not about homemaking, keeping women barefoot and pregnant and in the kitchen. It was exactly the opposite. And the founders of the field, you know, so it was, you know, it was not trapping women in the kitchen. It was redesigning the kitchen through science to reduce physical strain and be more efficient. It was not sewing aprons, it was setting manufacturing standards for fabric so shoppers wouldn't get shortchanged back you know, in the early 1900s. It was not done entirely by white women, it involved women of all races. It was not you know, baking sourdough bread. Uh, during the pandemic, people said to me like, oh, you." you're working on this book about home economics, aren't you baking all of this bread that's, so home ec that's, a, that's such a home ec thing to do? And the thing is that home economists believed in the value of a person's time. So they did scientific comparisons and to check the differences between home-baked and store-baked bread, and they put in standards that you couldn't sell flour that was whitened with arsenic but they absolutely believed in buying bread at the store if that's what meant that you, like there was nothing inherently romantic or better about making it at home. And it just, you know, it wasn't about wrapping bows around mason jars, you know, <laughs> despite all of the uh, Pinterest boards of weddings that we see these days. So the founders of home economics had two goals. One was to free women from drudgery and oppression by bringing science into the home so that women could get their work done faster and do only what needed to be done and move on to other things, whether that be paid employment, civic activism, education, spending time with their family, you know, whatever they wanted, and to create jobs. The, at the Lake Placid Conference in 1899, where the term home economics was actually coined, they talked about creating a new profession commanding adequate compensation. And the results that they envisioned were really utopian. They saw home economics as transforming society. They're very, were, were optimistic in a way that I find, you know, very, as a journalist, I find particularly uh, leavening to, to read about. They believed that this was going to create healthier, like healthier lives for everybody and fuller lives, that they could fend off problems in society at the past, that pe it would be the end of poverty. One of the early promoters of home economics was, and I'll mention a little bit more about him later, was Melville Dewey of the Dewey Decimal System. And there was this debate about which Dewey Decimal number home economics should get. And I know, right, but like, you know, they, I get, better than counting angels on the head of a pin, I suppose. And they wanted people, but it was also a question of a split, right? Because should it be in housework or should it be under poverty? Like should it be under handicrafts, right? Or poverty? And the home, the founders argued that it should be in poverty because they thought that home economics would abolish poverty. And they thought, well, not everybody shared this goal, but there were some people who thought that it would actually create racial equality as well. Uh, and a note on the sort of uh, home-baked bread and uh, mason jars front. This is uh, one of the early home economists in 1901, and she, you know, 
said, the, the woman who today makes her own soap instead of taking advantage of machinery for its production enslaves herself to ignorance by limiting her time for study. Uh, when I finished the book, I, cr I knitted my literary agent some washcloths and I sent them to her with <laughs> this note on it. <laughs> So, and yes, you know, they accomplish a great deal. This is a very partial list. They helped families survive scarcity and malnutrition through two world wars and the Great Depression. Uh, this photo here is from the Cornell archives and it is an educational rail car during World War I of the, basically the start of the extension service that was bringing uh, home and kitchen innovations to women so that they could update their kitchens and, as well as other things, create better food during rationing. They pioneered early ra radio programming. They were among the stars of early radio. They professionalized childcare. They created uh, daycares at universities and, in fact, some even more radical things than that. They created nutrition labeling, school lunch, the food groups. They popularized the calorie, which some of us might have some regrets over, but they did. They standardized women's clothing sizes. This did not last, but they measured a whole lot of, and it was imperfect, they measured a whole lot of white women with funding from the WPA and created standardized women's clothing sizes. And they developed the Toll House Cookie and the Rice Krispie Treat. <laughs> the Toll House Cookie, you guys may have heard, you know, Ruth Wakefield, like, and it, the myth portrays her as sort of like, oh, she had this little, Lunch, luncheonette, like in somewhere in that. She was she was trained in home economics, and she was doing institution management, lunchroom management, hotel management, and she created the the Tolas cookie. So, to give you guys a sense of the timeline of and some of the early important people. So the very first person to talk about home economics, what we now call home economics, was Catherine Beecher. And in 1841, she published a book called The Treatise on Domestic Economy. And it was this big, thick book. Uh, she was an educator. She was a very important women's educator, actually. And she was a member of the Beecher family, who we know today, but Harriet Beecher Stowe. But at the time, you know, there were preachers, there were, she, it was a, a famous family of intellectuals and writers. She believed that housekeeping was too important a subject to leave to the home. She believed that it should be taught in schools. And this was after a couple of decades of running schools for teenage girls, which was the, among the first schools for teenage girls, where they were learning this sort of standard intellectual curriculum like Greek and Latin and geology and so on. And this part of this, a large part of this book is like a household tips book that is extremely wide ranging. It is everything from the start at like calisthenics. She was also one of the founders of what became physical education uh, and home remedies for when people were sick. Uh, but the start of it was, is you know, this manifesto on the importance of teaching housekeeping. And it, but the weird part of it is that she did embrace this separate spheres ideology, right? Woman's place is in the home, her role is to be a mother. But she said that was more important because women raised the citizens of the nation, right? They raised the children. And honestly, probably more importantly, she didn't do any of that herself which was the start of a real, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, disconnect between our idea of home economics and in some cases what people were actually saying and the lives that home economists actually led. She never married. She didn't have children. She, when she wrote this book, she didn't have a home of her own. She was what we would now call kind of couch surfing, staying with former students for a few months at a time. and. You know, she, so she wrote about the, the, the role of the mother, but she didn't actually practice what she preached, which I think is interesting in part because it just goes to show that the idea that we have that many forces have pushed is that there is something natural to women about housekeeping, about mothering, about you know, mothering versus fathering, right? They're seen as sort of different things. And this is the start, I think, of showing that this, this is just not true at all. 
Like, they, girls had to learn how to do these things. They didn't come with the second X chromosome. And there wasn't anything like particularly natural about it necessarily. So the next important person uh, is a woman named Ellen Swallow Richards. So in, she was born in the 1840s in Massachusetts. It, I the, chose this particular you know, pinnacle turning point in her career because in 1871, she became the first woman to attend MIT. Uh, there she is alone uh, amongst the men. And she is, she was the first person I learned about when I started working on the project. And just the fact that one of the founding home economists was the first woman to attend MIT, right? Like immediately I was like this, everything that I think I know about home economics like, is wrong. She was a, an incredibly driven and brilliant person. And she grew up in a time where there was not much education, even for white people. And she pushed and pushed and did self-education when necessary, went to Vassar in her mid-20s because finally there was a women's college somewhere nearby for her to go to, or relatively nearby. And MIT did not, was new, it did not accept women, but she anyway you know, applied because she wanted to study advanced chemistry and there was just no place that could teach her advanced chemistry. Uh, she tried to apprentice to commercial chemists and they said, we can't teach you anything you don't know already. Uh, and she became a public health researcher and an environmental health researcher. She studied water quality, she studied uh, additives and uh, poisons in wallpaper, you know, these environmental hazards. Uh, but she also really devoted her career to helping other women learn science. And the turning point in the home economics story for her was that in the mid 1880s, she was in her lab and the uh, Boston school superintendent came in and he said, oh, like, what good will that do women in the kitchen? And, you know, he meant that as a put down, right? Like, and you, know, you go do your little thing, lady. But Ellen Swallow Richards being a thoughtful person, thought, geez, what good will this do women in the kitchen? And then she began to think about all the good it might do women in the kitchen. She envisioned, you know, women testing like learning how to test cream of tartar to see if it was adulterated and then going back to the store and saying you can't sell me this this dreck and she began creating all sorts of projects she created an early school lunch project in boston public schools she created a uh, takeout restaurant for low-income people in boston the idea was that factory workers would pick up food on their way home so that they could spend the evening eating and spending time with their families instead of cooking and cleaning. Um, because this is also a time, it's worth remembering, right, where housekeeping was incredibly arduous. You know, this is before you necessarily had running water in your own house, a fact that we all hoped had been fixed, you know, rather a few more than a few decades ago, unfortunately has not always been fixed, as you all know. It is a time where you might have to build a fire in your stove to get it to work, where there were no washing machines. You know, washing your clothing would backbreaking work. So it was, when you think about like reducing steps in a kitchen and redesigning it to make it easier, like that really mattered because housekeeping was incredibly grinding on the body and incredibly time consuming. So having takeout made a big difference. Um, she brought these projects to the World's Fair in 1893 uh, and was popularizing nutrition, put out these pamphlets that had the nutritional chemical breakdown of the foods that she was serving, which were designed to provide nutrition on a budget for people. Uh, so she was, and you know, through all of this, she continued to like test water quality the whole, her whole life. Wherever she went, she would, you know, grab a vial of water and she would bring it home and she would test it and she would read she married rather in her 30s and she uh, would read her husband was an industrial what was it? he was some sort of engineer that worked with uh he also taught at mit so and i think an industrial engineer you would call him and 
she would he she read German, he didn't, so she would like go through his German language engineering journals and like give him summaries. <laughs> she also loved gardening, side fact. And the other person I'm gonna spend most of the next of rest of the time talking about is Mississippi's own Margaret Marie Washington. Uh, and the turning point for her, I would say, is in 1889 when she took a job at Tuskegee. So Margaret Murray was born in Macon, Mississippi in either 1861, 1864, or 1865. She gave, she told people it was 1865. Uh, the, when she graduated from college, it said 1864. There was some record somewhere that said 1861. Nobody has been able to figure this out. I should mention that I am indebted to the scholars Linda Rochelle Lane and Sheena Harris for their work on this, because they did things like try to see if they could possibly track down when she was actually born, and they failed. So I did not have to. Uh, she was, well, from the stories that she told, none of which have been completely substantiated, she was born to a black washerwoman and an Irish railroad worker, so she was biracial. Uh, and her father died when she was quite young, her mother, mother remarried, she had a number of siblings. And she must have been just really obviously bright or potentially incredibly interested in education because what happened was there was a couple uh, two siblings a brother and sister the Saunders who were Quakers from the north and they came down and settled in her hometown and they were there to help black children become educated and she moved in with them and they taught her as much as that they could as much as that they as they were able and then they sent her to Nashville to attend Fisk Institute because she wanted more, she, you know, when she was ready to go on for more education. Uh, now, the things, I think my slide for this is next. Nope, I apparently screwed up the slide. So things, so, so some of the factors that were happening at this time to lead into home economics, partly was this rush of educational demand and educational opportunities. So. You have new colleges for new audiences. When Catherine Beecher was around, the only colleges had these classical curricula, and they were almost all of them for elite white men. There were very, very few uh, other options. There was one black college, there was Oberlin, which was co-ed and I believe integrated, but they bas there basically were no options if you weren't a fancy man who was studying things like Greek. But after the Civil War, you have this explosion in educational demand and opportunities for very different people. So you have colleges that are for women, they're for African Americans, they're for scientists, they're for farmers. And with all of them, there's this question of what they are going to teach. We are, is it appropriate to teach this classical curriculum or not. And some places did teach the classical curriculum and some did not. Uh, and the other forces that were operating were, you had the industrial revolution, right? You had machinery, you had factories, you had work moving out of the home and into uh, businesses. And the changes that those created, also you have the exodus of household labor with the end of slavery and with immigrant girls being able to work in factories, right? So these people who had been helping with this very difficult housework didn't want, you know, did not want those jobs if they could have helped it, and you had fewer of them doing it. So Margaret Murray went to one of these new higher education institutions for African Americans to Fisk in Nashville. And this was a classical curriculum. Uh, she spent something like eight years there. She had to work her way through, she taught school, and she did their high school course before she did their college course because you know, all of the black colleges had high schools because there were, I mean, you know, where there were schools for African Americans, they were grade schools only. Uh, and she got a job as she graduated, she 
was looking for a job as a professor, and at a key moment, she was going, she actually already accepted a job at Prairie View, but instead she sat across from Booker T. Washington at a dinner for the graduates, and he said, why don't you work for me? And she said, I thought you would never ask. Like, kind of literally, she had applied for a job and he had never replied. He was also, though, I mean, he was not only incredibly busy building Tuskegee literally brick by brick, the students made, built, made the bricks and built the buildings, but his second wife had just died. And he had two children. One was still like a baby. And, you know, he had a lot going on. And she came to teach English, and then she became dean of women for a while, but she very quickly adopted his philosophy on education. And this was the philosophy that became core in home economics, and especially core in home economics at land grant and black colleges, which is the idea that you should basically, you should, it, it's, this old, it's the age old question about education, right? Is it to build citizens or is it to help you get a job? And they thought it should help you with employment. Though, Washington also thought that it was inherently uh, elevating to your character to learn how to do things with your hands. Like that, with them going to, I might mis misquote him, but you know, there is as much honor in tilling a field as there is writing a poem, he said. I'm paraphrasing slightly. And she began to adopt that view as well. Um, she also, after a few years, got married to him and took on the, respon like, the responsibilities of being a stepmother, which she, there's some, a few letters that are still available in the Tuskegee archives that she sent to him in which she is truly distraught over her ability to be a good stepmother and worrying that she's not going to be a good enough stepmother and maybe they shouldn't get married after all. Uh, in the end, she did seem to have a good relationship with, well, with the, her stepsons. Her, the oldest girl was five when her, was the Washington's, the child of Washington's first wife, and she was understandably a little done with stepmothers. Um, but she ended up running home economics, which was then at that point called domestic science at Tuskegee for decades and for making it her life's work. So she created, um, I think I may have accidentally screwed up the slide on this as well. But so along with supervising the work that took place at Tuskegee, where all the students were required to take an industrial course as well as academics. So you would be trained in domestic science or in agriculture or in masonry as well as getting an academic education. She ran that for years, but possibly her even more influential work was in the community. So she was a, she became really what we would now call an extension worker. She believed in community education. And just a few years after she started working at Tuskegee, she was sitting at the um, first black farmers convention that Tuskegee had organized. And she was listening and she thought, well, this is all great, but what about their wives? Like, what, what is here for their wives? And she created the Tuskegee Women's Club. This was a time where um, women's clubs were a big deal in the 1890s and, and 19, early 1900s. And they were often, I mean, some of the white ones were very involved in the, the progressive movement. Some weren't. The black ones were all about race uplift as well as all their other um, hundreds of, they, they have, I looked at their minutes. They were like taking over a youth detention center and making it better. They were working on suffrage. They were working on temperance. They were working on moral purity. And the biggest part that Margaret Murray was doing was she was working on housekeeping education for sharecropper wives, basically. And she produced a book uh, booklet, really, they did in 1894 called Work for the Colored Women of the South. And it was, I mean, I certainly couldn't find anything before it that was anything similar, right? It was a housekeeping tips 
for black women who were like dirt poor. There is uh, advice on how to create furniture when you don't have anything. So, you know, how to make a closet out of a sheet of calico and like a stick of wood, like a stick basically, so that you can at least hang your clothes on pegs on the wall out of view. How to create a chair out of a crate, like cover it with fabric. And she talked about the import, like the, the importance of self-respect that it gave you to sit on a chair and not the floor. Even if the chair is, you know, just a, a milk crate, that it was important to have, it, there are definitely people who said at the time and since that the Washington's view was very, was too bootstrappy, was very middle class, you know, was trying to fit people into a particular mold of virtue, but you know, she genuinely believed that having a nicer home and con conforming as best you could to middle class norms uh, built self pride, which was political, right? Like we're talking about like 1894 in Alabama, and that it would promote economic self sufficiency. And it would eventually lead to respect by whites who would say like, ah, oh, these people are just the same as us. And even if it didn't, people would be leaving, le leading better lives. Uh, so she brought this message of the importance of the black home to the black community and of having a good home. And she brought that internationally. She brought it to, I mean, she met the Queen of England. She was constantly giving speeches and traveling around the country to you know, groups that were white, black, integrated. And I'm going to, at the same, so as she is doing all this, uh, home ec schools of domestic science are beginning to really take hold, not just at Tuskegee, but at a lot of other places. The women's colleges were less sure that they wanted to get involved with this, but the land grant and black colleges did. Uh, so some of the, so here's what domestic science looked like at Tuskegee in 1905. So here is this whole list of trades that women were being trained to do, right? So hospital, dairying, broom making, like this was a time right before you could just go to Home Depot and buy a broom different kinds of sewing, right? From dressmaking to millinery, horticulture, housekeeping. And she believed, by the way, that she was training women to be teachers, mostly. Uh, I was speaking with Mississippi Public Broadcasting yesterday and was asked, you know, was, was she training women to be maids in, other, in white people's houses? And she did not, that's not what she was about, right? That's not what getting a college education that included domestic science was about. It meant that you were going to be a teacher and a moral leader or someone maybe who had her own business. And she actually ran, she, she basically ran like a job placement service, which is to say everyone just wrote her asking like, hey, I need a domestic science teacher for my school in Indiana, can you send me somebody? And she'd say, ah, yes, this recent graduate is terrific. Um, Oh, here are some of her uh, activism and advocacy as well, where she, um, the, she got involved in the National Association of Colored Women's Clubs, which was the Tuskegee, like the group, the consortium of small women's clubs. Uh, and she opposed meeting at the exposition grounds in the World's Fair because it was segregated. And this year, so this is, you know, a heart-to-heart -heart talk with the first lady of the land. Like, this is how big she was. Uh, so and here's, here's some of what is going on in Mississippi at this time. So this is Mississippi University for Women, uh, the front view of the college in about 1890. Uh, and they had industrial studies for women, right? So here we have dressmaking, right? And they have some stuff that's sort of not terribly practical, right? Like oil painting. But they had people, you know, who were, the women who were studying to, for the trades, right? Bookkeeping, that was something that a woman could do and 
get jobs and have it not be, you know, well, support herself. Um, I feel like my, I have somehow managed to get some of my slides out of orders, so I am, ah, I see what happened. So also, at the same time, you had domestic science moving F forward at Alcorn, for instance, which did not accept women until about 1902, 1903, but as soon as they had that, you had domestic science for them to take. And then in 1899, you had the first Lake Placid Conference. So this was the conference where home economics was, what's the word I'm looking for? St standardized, I guess you could say. So this was, at, by this point, you had several decades of activity in domestic science. And you had these, you had cooking schools, for instance, for mid middle class women. You had classes for children in public schools, like major cities like were introducing domestic science for children. You had the university programs. But were they all teaching the same thing? Did they have the same philosophy? And Ellen Swallow Richards, who was in front there, uh, thought that a lot of them were doing it wrong. So she thought that a lot of them, and a lot of them she thought were doing it wrong in precisely the way that we get home economics wrong today, which is that she thought that they were doing fussy things that weren't practical. So there were immigrant children and poor children who were being taught fancy embroidery. Obviously that was useless, right? Like if they, they should learn how to mend, they should potentially learn how to make clothes, but even then, you know, the home economists would want to do an analysis of, you know, you could buy clothing, right, at the, at the store by this point. Uh, there were some of the cooking classes were like fancy dishes to impress people. They thought, she thought that was useless as well. And so a group of people in the field uh, coordinated by Annie Dewey, who is at the far left there, left, yes, um, she, and who is Melville's wife and a librarian herself, got together at the Melville's resort and decided to have this first conference to talk about domestic science and what it should be. And the first thing they did was they gave it a new name. They called it home economics. And they thought that home economics was a more, was a name that demanded more respect because it wasn't domestic, right? It was about economics. It sounded more, despite the word science, right, scientific, they thought. And it just let them sort of relaunch it in the way that they thought it should be. So they, they met for 10 years, they created curricula for grade schools, high schools, colleges. They began, began creating more and more college departments. Uh, they were starting colleges, this is when they started at Cornell, which is became one of the powerhouses of home economics education and research. They connected with the USDA, which became an extremely important support for the profession, which continues to this day. Uh, eventually, they connected to vocational education as well when that became federally funded. And they, you know, just, they, they, it, the transcripts of this are really amazing because they just are full of this vision of what people's lives could be. And they talked about like cooperative housekeeping and could it work, right? So like that's saying, you know, instead of individual people doing their own housework, you would get together and have like a, either a staff for a building or some sort of co-op where you didn't have to have like every person spending time doing this stuff every day. Uh, they talked about, you know, cooperative cafeterias, right? So like, like Ellen Swallow Richards' project with takeout, where you would have, you know, so, you know, spoke to somebody here who is now doing sort of family meal prepping where different people take different weeks. So then you've got a week where you don't have to make your own lunch or your own meals. Someone else is making it for you. And then you just cook twice as much when it's your week, right? So much more efficient. This, not all of this flew, obviously, right? Like the... The takeout shop uh, crashed and burned because 
uh, the people who were being marketed to didn't like the food. They thought it was too bland. Uh, and they, and Ellen Swallow Richards was forced to conclude that basically people were not sufficiently advanced yet to see why this was important. Uh, and she once wrote the sarc sarcastically something like, you know, as long as the American, Americans are addicted to the taste of their own household bacteria, we will, progress will necessarily be limited. <laughs> So yeah, they spent you know ten years working on this project, and by the end of it, they had a real like they had a thousand member organization that became the American Home Economics Association. They were really on their way to creating the a profession that then went on you know for many decades to produce countless jobs and. You know, and the the advancements that I mentioned, they had a bureau that was part of the USDA that was you know a career path for women, but there was something really important that they left out at the Lake Placid Convention, which is I started looking through and saying, uh, so are these all white women? And they were. So here's the thing, the Deweys the Deweys coordinated the Lake Placid Conference, which was a surprise to me because they're less, they're downplayed. Uh, and Ellen and her, the, her colleagues left for it because Melville Dewey was the state librarian of New York. They had an in with the curriculum creators. They thought like this is gonna be a way that we can really get education, home economics education into a major state and its schools. The Deweys also, this Lake Placid resort of theirs was all white. They did not accept African Americans. They did not take Jews. Uh, this, within about five years, actually totally blew up. And Melville Dewey, you know, it's like, he was in 1905, 1906, he was forced to leave his job. He was pushed out of the American Library Association, which he had helped found. And that was because there were so many accusations of sexual harassment that he, and he apparently never, maybe it was not like his equals, right? But he, there was no records of him trying to put the moves on the home economist, but these were librarian, like young women librarians, basically. And uh, Jewish men in New York, businessmen, found out about the Lake Placid Resort and were really offended and said, excuse me, the State Librarian of New York should not I mean, be having a resort that is anti-Semitic and racist. And he was forced to leave. And you know, it really strikes me. It's like, how bad you have to be to be canceled in 1905, right? <laughs> and they did not invite Margaret Murray Washington. She knew who they were. They knew who she was. I, they had written about Tuskegee. I mean, Tuskegee's domestic science program was written about in mainstream magazines. Uh, Ellen Swallow Richards was really excited about a, basically a slow cooker that Tuskegee, that Booker T. Washington had found out about, and they were using it Tuskegee. Like, people were really into the slow cooker. Uh, she had sent, Washington had sent some of her teachers to the house keeping institutes put on by some of the women who went to Lake Placid. And, but they didn't, you know, they didn't ask her. And <clears throat> Margaret's point of view seems to basically been like, who needs them anyway? She was doing her own work. She was incredibly busy. She was focused on helping black women. Uh, she did continue to use the word domestic science for the Tuskegee program. Af well after most everybody else had started using home economics, and I wonder if she did that kind of out of spite because she definitely could hold a grudge. Um, and I'm, she, she, I, sh I assumed that she felt like, well, you know, it's their loss. Like, I don't need them. Go on. But, you know, the, 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 the fact is, and, you know, I went through and 
I do not have time, unfortunately, to get into all of this. You know, there were people who, within the home economics movement, who were actively racist and who believed in eugenics and who believed in, you know, Americanizing in immigrants. There were people who, like Ellen, who seemed to just sort of go with go with it. Like they knew perfectly well that Lake Placid was an all-white resort, but they went and had the, had the conferences there anyway. But what this started was, or continued really, was a decades-long separation where you have this mainstream home economics movement that continued to gain prominence and influence that was white, especially completely white in the South, and then you had the many, many black women who were home economists who were in segregated, everything from 4-H to, you know, schools to the USDA, right? Like all of their work was segregated, but extremely important to their communities. And, you know, very much due to the work of Margaret Murray Washington. So with that, oh, I should say one last thing, which is that all of this, home economics is still here today. Uh, they rebranded again. They went, the, the old name, home economics, right? How all these, uh, connotations to it. So they, back in the early 90s, the field changed its name. It's now known as Family and Consumer Sciences. And there is still quite a bit of it in Mississippi. You can still get degrees in home economics education. Uh, you can still get a job in the extension service working on nutrition and things like that. And you can still join the club that used to be known as the Future Homemakers of America. It is now FCCLA, Family Career Con Community Leaders of America. And the last reporting that I did for the book was I went to the Mississippi FCCLA conference in early March of 2020, and it was, you know, vibrant. It was all of these kids, boys and girls, and working on these projects, everything from like helping foster children to period poverty to sports nutrition and to like, you know, cooking, right? Lots of cooking. And thus all of these kids like spending their time working on home economics projects. And it was extremely, you know, uplifting seeing teenagers do all of this. So now I will actually stop and I would love to have your questions. Just keep talking. Is it going? All right. <laughs> Thanks for your presentation, but I uh, would like for you to correct one slide you showed up there. Uh, MUW, uh -huh. the W, uh, was founded in 1884 as IINC, Industrial Institute and College. Yes, it was, and I just, I went with its contemporary name because I thought it would be less confusing to people, but yes, that it was, it was founded as an organization, as a educational institution that was specifically looking at these, you know, worked career-based, what we call now like a career-oriented learning. Thank you, it's very interesting. Uh, I'm just wondering a little bit, because the 1880s, 1890s, there were other trends, other forces sweeping through the United States. Mm -hmm. um, populism and theosophy was a big women's-led faith and some other things. And I'm just wondering if some of these kind of intersected with some of the stuff you were talking about. You know, the theosophy one is a really good question, and I have a totally separate, like, interest in that as well, and I should see whether uh, there is any overlap. I can say that a few things. One is home economics was very much part of the progressive movement. So social work, uh, social work in particular, right? Consumer protection, uh, all of that, like, they were very, I'm blanking on, the, the woman who founded Hull House, she was she attended one of the Lake Placid conferences, and in fact, you know, social work is something that you can still go into with a degree in home economics. Uh, they also the temperance movement was very was tightly entwined because that's what these women's clubs were doing. A lot of them. So I think, and you know, there was spiritualism. I think and theosophy. You know, there was. There was a, line, a strain of women's empowerment in that as well, right? The, the figures at the forefront of these uh, movements, which if, for those who don't know, were basically 
occult-oriented religious movements that had a lot to do with contacting the, the dead who were you know, seen as beyond the veil. And there were certainly lots of hucksters in that world, but there were a lot of people also who took it very seriously. It was very popular. And the leading figures that I can think of in that world are women. So I think that, and you know, suffrage, the suffrage movement, of course, was at its height at this time. Uh, Ellen Swallow Richards thought there was no need to work on suffrage because it was so obvious that like women should just have the right to vote, that it wasn't like other people can, like it's coming anyway. Uh, but yeah, it was, it was definitely entwined with its time, which is how I found out about the eugenics connection because eugenics was sadly also very popular and popular among people who were you know, in the progressive social movements. So I started looking and saying like, there must, they must have intersected here as well. Making sure Chris gets his steps in. <laughs> um, could you kind of go back, you were mentioning, I think you were talking about Margaret Murray Washington um, teaching folks that, you know, you shouldn't sit on the ground, you should sit in a chair. Mm -hmm. And, um, is that music I hear? Um, and I was thinking to myself, is that an example of her teaching them respectability politics? Or was she trying to instill a sense of dignity, you know, within some of these folks not too far removed from slavery? That is exactly the question, right? So that was the that was the, that was the conflict. So you know, it was the the general question of in certainly the education realm, right? Of whether you should be training people to be citizens or to be workers uh, was particularly acute in the black community. And Booker T. Washington was absolutely seen as an avatar of respectability politics, of compromise, of you know, bootstrapping, of you know, saying, giving a speech where he says, you know, look to, to a speech to a white audience, the famous Atlanta Compromise speech, where he's saying basically, just give us economic respect and self-sufficiency. We don't have to like be friends. Uh, to paraphrase immensely. And you know, the other side of this argument was very acute. And W.E.B. Du Bois, who went to Fisk with Margaret Murray Washington, they worked on the school paper together. Uh, he was the emblem of the other side of this argument that says, like, excuse me, it's about racism, it's structural. It doesn't matter how respectable our people act, that they're not the problem. He, of course, outlived the Washingtons by decades. And I would say that this many years after civil rights efforts, it seems quite obvious that Du Bois was right that racism is the problem and not how individual black people are acting. However, uh, Washington really believed that in this, this vision that, be, that adopting middle class values of taking care of yourself, taking care of your home, was helpful to self-respect. And she, she, like she, one of the pieces that sticks out in her, uh, the booklet of household advice, one of the pieces that she wrote was about what to wear. And she thought that black women shouldn't wrap their hair because that was a sign of slavery because that was when women were not given the opportunity to take care of their own hair and they were treated worse than horses because the horses had, you know, were, their coats were taken care of. And that this was like to, to sort of de-inscribe slavery from a person's body was if you, you could help do that if you took care of your hair nicely. So the end, all that said, both she and her husband did a whole lot that actually was pretty directly confronting racism and racist strictures, such as you know, refusing to hold a meeting on the grounds of a World's Fair that was excluding African Americans. Uh, she worked on, at the end of her life, on something called the uh, International Council of Women of the Darker Races, 
So it was this early like global pan-African movement. Uh, but yeah, I mean, that's exactly the, the question that remains. And I tried to you know, present both sides of it while presenting you know, what she truly believed that she was doing. We have a question from the live stream. What was the federal government's role in development of home economics, and where did these early home economists work? Great question. Uh, they worked in a, most of them worked for universities. Uh, a lot of them were also entrepreneurs. They were, some of them had cooking schools or they uh, worked for publications. There was a, like a kitchen publication and the editors and the cookbook writers would come to the uh, Lake Placid conferences. The federal government began getting involved, well, really the federal government began getting involved in the 1860s with the development of land-grant universities because that's what opened up education to all of these rural people and a far broader range of people which then let raise the question of what they were going to learn. And then in 1890, they, the federal government came in and made sure that that funding was also going to black colleges in the South. But then starting in about 1905 or so, you have the federal government's uh, agriculture people getting interested in home economics and teaming up with the home economists. And this was a big goal of the Lake Placid home economist was getting this federal support. So to do things like funding research where you might research, you know, different ways of cooking meat, for instance. So this was one of the reasons that home, home economics became an employer for women scientists because you weren't allowed to study chemistry, but if you studied the chemistry of meat, that was like more ladylike and you, you were allowed to do that. Uh, so, but then the federal government really got involved in the 1910s where they funded uh, extent, first extension and then vocational education. And for vocational education, the only career path that was recognized for women was home economics. So all of this basically teacher training funding went into the colleges uh, to, to train teachers of home economics. And you had with extension, the creation of home demonstration agents who would bring home economics research out to the community. Things like, you know, the slow cooker, doing research during, uh, doing, doing, doing research during rationing on like how to make wheatless breads. Sometimes it's really funny, like the extent to which these recipes look like recipes of today, because they're all things like, you know, wheatless breads. <laughs> Uh, wait, don't you eat meat, eat legumes, eat, eat black-eyed peas. There's a, there are booklets on like 50 different ways, to home economics booklets, like 50 different ways to cook with a cow pea. One of them was uh, put together with, by George Washington Carver, and he's like, this one is particularly good. <laughs> uh, and also then World War I. World War I was really in the midst of this, what brought home economists to the fore because Herbert Hoover, who was head of the U.S. Food Administration, called up Cornell, well, telegraphed Cornell, and said, we need you to come and help, like rationing was voluntary. We need you to help people ration and cook with less sugar and less wheat and try to you know, convert the, affect the hearts and minds of Americans to get involved in this. And so that from then on, the, the Oh, I guess I should say, and then in 1923, the USDA formally created a Bureau of Home Economics, which had the uh, highest, uh, I guess it was executive branch woman who had been in federal government at the time. We have another comment from the live stream. Joyce Shaw says, one of our women scientists told me she majored in home ec because they would not let women major in chemistry at the university she attended in Florida in the late 1950s. She later got a PhD in environmental chemistry at the University of Texas at Austin. And then uh, Sarah Campbell asks, is Margaret Murray Washington's booklet available for inspection at an archive, and if so, where? Oh, great question. So, Hatha Trust. I cannot say enough good things about Hatha Trust. H-A-T-H-I uh, Trust. It is ba an online, basically lots and lots of archives and research universities uh, that have scanned and digitized their 
books of various sorts, make them available through Half the Trust, and it's free. Uh, sometimes you need like a, you may need a university membership to like download the full book or something, but I completely relied on this service because I did not have the funding to like go everywhere. Like I did get to go to Tuskegee, but that was for, you know, four days in the archives as opposed to everything I needed to see. So yes, the, that book, the booklet is in the archive, in Half a Trust, you can just look it up. It's under, I think, Mrs. B.W. B.T., it's under, like, Mrs. B.T. Washington is the uh, author of it. But yes, you can look it up and look up a lot of the things. I mean, read the entire run of the Journal of Home Economics from its start to through, like, 1985 or something. We have copies of Danielle's book, The Secret History of Home Economics, for sale over here. If you didn't get enough of it today, she'll be at the Natchez Literary and Cinema Celebration this weekend. Um, thank you for being here. Come back next week when Martin Zwiers will speak to us. He'll also be at the Mississippi Historical Society's annual meeting. So clear up your calendar. Come to all of it. <laughs> for now, help me thank Danielle Dreilinger for this fabulous presentation. Thank you.